you. Um, yeah, but the uh, week last Sunday, I had the most momentous day sitting in my pajamas on my sofa, <laughs> um, watching the crowdfunder and the crowd justice um, crowdfunder go up and up, and watching the comments come in. Um, I've, I've never had such a quiet but momentous day, and I, I feel like you're probably all there sitting on the sofa with me. Um, uh, donating and commenting and sharing um, and I think there's going to be quite a long journey ahead on the court case and actually I've been uh, um, misintroduced I'm not going to talk very much about the court case because um, because I can't at this point um, I'm going to talk about uh, the work that I, that I did and the things that I wrote uh, leading up to that um, but I think uh, you know the, the the message just from the speed and the number of uh, uh, comments and donations of support that sent to say that, that this matters, that we're not going to shut up and that we're not alone, I think is what I felt sitting on my sofa uh, two Sundays ago. Um, and uh, thank you all. I feel such a responsibility um, taking that forward. So thank you very much. Um, but what I am going to talk about is uh, my sort of day job before that, which is that I worked for an international development think tank, um, and it was it is a serious place, you know, full of evidence and debate. And when I started to follow uh, this issue and think about uh, the difference between sex and gender and what that means in policy and practice. I was thinking about that in the UK and in relation to the Gender Recognition Act, but I was also thinking about that in relation to international development. And by that I mean government to government cooperation, um, <clears throat> aid, but also trade, diplomacy, human rights, um, migration, <laughs> international tax rules, which is what I actually work on. Um, you know, in all of those things, uh, sex matters. But in international development, people always say gender, but they mean <coughs> sex. Um, and so things like the UK government, the World Bank, the IMF, um, charities like Oxfam and ActionAid and Amnesty International, they're all <coughs> talking about gender now all the time, seeing how important it is to international development. And by gender, they mean sex. Um, uh, and the sustainable development goals, which were set by the governments of the world to say these are the things that we're going to do together, include for the first time a, a, a goal on gender, by which they mean sex. <laughs> um, on uh, violence against women, on reproductive health care, um, and on the economic empowerment of women. And, um, so I was just reading uh, this morning, in fact, um, Oxfam has just come out with a, uh, a new strategy document calling for feminist policy on aid. Um, and they talk about the context for that and why, why we need that. They talk about at current rates of progress, it will take 202 years to close the global economic gender gap. And by gender, they mean. <laughs> <laughs> they say more than half of the world's women are legally restricted from working in certain sectors because of their gender. <laughs> and by gender, they mean sex. They say it is estimated that 650 million women and girls worldwide were married before the age of 18, many of them facing violence and other severe violations of their rights. At least 200 million women and girls alive today have undergone female genital mutilation. 35% of women worldwide experience physical or sexual intimate partner violence. Every day, women do 16.4 billion hours of unpaid care work, at least twice as much and in some places 10 times as much as men. Each year, Worldwide, more than 200 million women want to, avoid con want to avoid pregnancy, but don't have access to modern contraception. 25 million unsafe abortions take place, 
and globally more than 130 million school-age girls don't attend school. In all these issues, when they say gender, they mean sex. None of this has anything to do with gender identity. And all of these organisations that are working on international, international development and development cooperation would have a really hard time talking about their research, talking about their programmes, talking about their goals, if they didn't have a word for female people. And yet, we're sitting here in London saying, we don't need a word for, you, for, for female people anymore, that's old-fashioned. Um, and I just didn't understand that. Um, and yet, while international development organisations are doing all this work, which is about sex and about the inequalities and oppression that women face because of their sex and because of the way society treats women because of their sex, none of them were willing or able to stand up for the biological definition of sex and say, this is what we're talking about. Um, and many foundations that fund uh, the work of charities, um, foundations such as George Soros' Open Society Foundation, but also many others, um, and particularly organisations working in the human rights field, have all started to push for um, gender self-identification and for replacing the definition of sex with gender identity. And none of them have promoted any kind of analysis or debate about what impact this will have on women and girls. It's all driven by um, compassion and inclusion, which I think we all share, but it's, none of it's been underpinned by any kind of analysis of how this will impact on, on women and girls. And I think a lot of my, and I don't work on gender in development, but a lot of my colleagues do, they, you know, they look at things with sex disaggregated data, they work on all of these kinds of issues. And I think people think if they just stay quiet, if they just, if they know that when they say gender they mean sex, and if they don't rock the boat, they can get on with doing that work, and that can be quite separate from the, the, you know, the quite toxic debate that we're having here about the difference between gender and sex. And they say to me, you know, why does this matter? If we've got, we're, we're thinking about climate change, we're thinking about humanitarian emergencies, we're thinking about corruption, we're thinking about um, economic development and industrial policy. Why does this toxic debate that's going on on Twitter um, and you know, in some corners of, of Europe and North America, matter. And I think it, I think it matters, and I made the case that it matters um, because I think development, at its heart, is about organisations doing their job. It's about having more organisations doing more jobs better. And organisations can only do their job when they're able to name things, when they're able to talk truthfully when they're able to categorise, where they're able to communicate and where they're able to debate. You know, schools <coughs> teaching children, universities building knowledge, doctors treating people, um, businesses investing and providing products that people need, and governments collecting taxes, setting rules, delivering services, and the media watching and scrutinising what's going on and being able to report it truthfully and people being able to hold their institutions to account on everything. And this is just one issue. Um, and this is one issue where all of that is not working. And so I think that matters. If we can't name things, we can't speak the truth, then organisations can't do their job. And being able to name... able to name the difference between men and women is, is fundamental. And if we can't name those basic truths, then our organisations become corrupted. Um, and then I think there are a couple of sort of more specific reasons why this matters for international development. So um, in international development, they talk about SOGI, 
sexual orientation and gender identity when they're thinking about human rights. Um, and you know, gender identity becomes tied to sexuality. And we can separate those things out, but often in countries where, uh, you know, where same-sex relationships are criminalized, that applies both to, uh, to gay and lesbian people and to transgender people, and all of those human rights are tied together. Um, uh, and so, but when I talk to people who work with um, with transgender or with you know um, yeah with transgender communities in different countries and in different cultures, they don't say trans women are women, as is the the uh, debate that's going on here. They say these are specific communities with specific vulnerabilities and specific needs in relation to healthcare, in relation, in relation to HIV, in relation to discrimination and violence, and they need specific protections. But what they're not saying, at least the people I've spoken to, and as I say, this is not the area that I work in, um, is that these are the same things, that trans, that trans rights are women's rights, as, as we hear here. So I think, you know, within organisations that are working on transgender rights, they are not uh, replicating the, the debate that's going on here. They're talking about separate human rights protections for different categories of people. Um, and then secondly, I think where organisations are trying to put sex, sex <coughs> Uh, oppression and inequality that affects women as a sex in, into the heart of their work and they're calling it gender and they've always called it gender and partly they do that because if you say sex it sounds like you're talking about people, you know it sounds like you're talking about sex <laughs> <laughs> so people say gender because it just sounds more polite and maybe more intelligent and, and you know maybe you can't stop people doing that like sometimes i look at these titles in these reports and i say can you not call that the little report, you know, the little book of sex statistics. Um, and it's, no, no, we can't, we can't call it that. So, um, so I can see why they're going to continue saying gender when they mean sex. But I think um, they need to be clear of, of what the of when they when they're talking about sex and when they're talking about gender identity, and the two are not the same. And so. Um, so I wrote a blog post on this, and I, I published it for International Women's Day, and I set out five things that I thought the international development sector should do to have a better debate on this, and I stole them from Women's Place UK, but I just <laughs> thought about it in, in an international context. And the five things I said was that sex and gender identity are not the same. We should be clear about what we mean. There should be open and evidence-based discussion on how potential policy changes will affect women's rights, single-sex spaces, and safeguarding. Women and women's organisations should be involved in policy debates. Data matters. Statistics on crime, employment, pay, and health should continue to be categorised by sex. You can also collect information about gender identity, but that's separate. And number five, people who express concern about impacts on women's rights and women's spaces should not be dismissed as hateful or bigots. And I wrote in the article that you shouldn't have to be brave to talk about this. Um, and I still think you shouldn't have to be brave to talk about this. Um, but having, it wasn't a single tweet, but having tweeted about this issue for a while um, and also circulated drafts of this article, there were complaints that I was talking about this and that it could be um, deemed as being offensive to some people and ultimately um, I, I lost my job because of that. And so I am taking my employer to employment tribunal. Uh, it's a case on discrimination based on belief so the question of whether having gender critical beliefs is something that you shouldn't be discriminated against in the same way as any other serious uh, philosophical belief. Um, and, if I, and if I win that case, that will obviously give 
some protection for other people in jobs who are scared about speaking out um, because they may uh, affect them at work, and also uh, Twitter um, and other social media sites which are available um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll also have to think again uh, about uh, discriminating against people for having gender critical beliefs. Ultimately, I think this is about standing up for respectful, serious, evidence-based debate and democratic disagreement. Um, and I really think, you know, sitting on my sofa two weeks ago, I felt like the tide was turning and I hope I'm passing that. Yeah.